This morning's message comes from Mark chapter 10, and we'll be looking at verses 2 through 9 because that deals with a question from the Pharisees. My theme this morning is two, but one. Two individuals, but God looks at those two individuals as one in the ceremony of marriage. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's word that a man and wife are to be regarded as a single organism. For that is what the word one flesh would be in modern English. One flesh means one organism, one body. The two becoming one. Though we don't see that physically with our eyes because you see two separate individuals but we are to be one in like-minded in desires and goals and plans really that's God's ideal plan and when we are not then we're not fulfilling that one flesh that he has for us question for you think about this for a second what does marriage mean to you I'll give you some time here what does marriage really mean to you what does marriage mean to me My clothes are washed. I got food on the table. No, no, no. Let's get deeper. What does marriage really mean to you? Uh, I don't know if you, how many saw the Super Bowl last Sunday? That that was a great game. Uh, I I really wasn't for one team or the other, but after a while, watching um, the game, finding out that um, um, Denver uh, could set some records, you know, um, I'm trying to remember his name. What's his name? Uh, Manning, that Manning could could be uh, a, a record setter in 200 wins, you know, and then going to the Super Bowl, his second second win. I thought, okay, I'm going for Denver. That's that's what I'm going for. But how many saw Lady Gaga sing the national anthem? Well, that was just off the hook. It's like, wow, she just sang that thing. I mean, I think that's the best national anthem that I have ever heard. And I've been around for a long time. You know, it was really good. Somebody asked her. How did you sing that anthem so well? This is what she said. I just thought about the lyrics and what they really mean, said Gaga. They've been around a long time, so I thought about what they mean now, and I just sang from my heart. Think about that. Now, I'm not endorsing Lady Gaga at all. I totally get that she is way out there. You know, this Italian woman that... that, uh, does some crazy things but she she just nailed that song and the reason that she nailed it is that she thought about the meaning of the song the meaning of being an american the meaning of the sacrifice of men and women soldiers for this country that we could have freedom here that we have the independence of other nations and countries, that we have the freedom to meet together as a body of Christ, just as anyone else has the freedom not to meet in a church if they choose not to meet. That's fine. But we have the freedom. And and, and just thinking of the flag and what it represents and then singing from her heart. And boy, she nailed it because she got the meaning. What does marriage mean to you? What does marriage really mean to you? Have you thought of that? Have you really thought what the institution of marriage really means to you, to your husband, to your children, to your children who need to see a good godly marriage and to the community and to our world? Because our world is crumbling because we don't have good marriages. 50% or more within the church divorce rate because people aren't willing to um, submit to marriage. It's just amazing what's going on and we need a good marriage. So what does it really mean? And then live your marriage out with all your heart. Live it out with all your heart and let people see that it's off the hook. Now the Pharisees are asking Jesus, is it lawful to divorce your wife? Look at verse two of Mark. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife 
and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. He says it twice there to emphasize the importance of being one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The Pharisees asked, is it lawful to divorce your wife? This is a question that is still being asked today by many Christians and usually by those who are looking to get divorced. (laughs) Is it lawful for me to get out of this situation because I'm just miserable? Is it lawful for me to to, to get divorced because I just don't love him anymore, you know? And they're, they're just looking for an opportunity for the right or the justification to do so. Now, we know that these religious leaders were trying to trip Jesus up. So they asked him the most theological, controversial question of that day. And it's still an issue that's controversial today within the church itself. It just seems like believers just really don't care of the meaning of marriage. And they don't care what God has to say about it. The Jews held marriage very highly. It was holy to them. It was a ceremony that they lifted up. And we should too, if we understand the meaning. They would say the temple altar would shed tears if there is a divorce. And Christians today are dealing with the same issues and same controversies as they were back then. I hear things like, I can't get a divorce, or can I get a divorce and ask God for forgiveness later? Right? I'm trying to justify it. Or, or how about, God wants me happy, doesn't he? So let me just get a divorce. Or you don't understand, I never should have married the person. He was the wrong person. She was the wrong lady. You hear those excuses. Those are all wrong excuses. The common understanding of marriage and divorce in Christ's day was that divorce was permitted as long as you completed the paperwork. I mean, it was so bad during that time that all a man had to really do was come up to the priest and say in front of the priest with his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you. I divorced you and it was legal and they give you a paper and it was done. Just that easy. That rabbi would write that certificate and you would go away. The dari would then be for the woman to be taken care of for the rest of her life. Jesus said to Moses that he permitted it because of the hardness of the heart of the people. They hardened their hearts because of their attitude towards God's law. Not the hardness towards their spouse, but the hardness of God's law. They disregarded God's law. They didn't care about God's law. They weren't concerned what God thought about our relationship and our marriage. They were more concerned about their own emotions and feelings. So divorce was never in God's plan. It is not his best for us. You see, God made it very clear from the beginning, two but one. Very clear, two but one. Look at verse eight again. The two shall become one flesh, So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And that doesn't mean outside man. That includes you. You should not separate. You should not make the choice to destroy what God had put together. Yes, that means that God put together what you decided to do years ago. Well, I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. But God knew it, and God allowed it, and God put you together, and now you work it out. You work it out, and it may be a hard work, but you need to do that work to make a great marriage. From the beginning, God created created, uh, male and female to be joined together, to become one, and to never separate. Genesis 1.27 is very clear what Jesus said here. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. We are to have dominion as men and women of this earth. God created us in his image, and we are to have dominion over our relationship. He goes on to chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Leave is very strong in the Hebrew. It means leave behind. We are to leave behind our father and mother. That doesn't mean that you, you kick them out and never speak to them again. It doesn't mean that you don't have fellowship with them. It just means that you have now become a unit within yourselves. And you are to be that unit. You still have responsibilities to your father and mother. 
But you are to leave them behind when it comes to the, uh, that relationship. You're no longer tied to them. At one point, your father and mother in that relationship with you had authority over you. And you were a part of their unit. But now you have left them and you leave that behind and you are now joined to your spouse and now you become a unit and the offspring becomes a part of that unit and you are to be joined to your wife that word join means to stick to it actually means glue you literally are stuck and you can't get out and there are people like eh, you know come on let me just get out. no you know god says you're stuck eh, you know ah. You know, it, he wants you stuck. That is it. You ever get, um, what do they, they call that, super glue on your fingers? You ever do that? You're like, oh, no, what do I do now? You know, and don't touch your face. Oh, no, you know, and it's just like you're stuck, and then you're going to pull, have you ever pulled the skin back because of it? I know I have because of the super glue. It means you're stuck together, and that's it, and it should never come apart. You become one flesh. In the marriage ceremony, you all know the marriage ceremony and, and how the bride and the father come walking up and they're both standing there and the officiator offers up the prayer, the blessings and all of that. At that immediate moment when that father goes, I give her to him, they become one. Immediately they become one. She, he, she just left that unit and now joined him to become one. And God views them as one. And children are the fruit of that, right? because you have become one because you have koinonia that fellowship intimacy and it is talking even of sexual relationships of being one that's why god hates divorce because when you uh, divorce from adultery because now you've just added another person in there and now you've become one with that person and now you've got another uh, involved in that situation it just causes havoc but the offspring are the evidence of your oneness you know it, it's it's not Oh, that's your kid, not my kid. No, it's our kid. And your parents do that. No, that's your son. No, that's your son, the way he's acting. He's not my son. My child don't act like that. No, they are your children, and they are a part of you, and they're acting like that because you're not being the light that you're supposed to be. This is God's divine idea of marriage. Marriage is an institution made by God and not man, and we need to truly understand that. What is marriage? What is marriage really? It is an institution made by God. God himself created the man and the woman. God himself officiated over that first marriage. God himself puts you together with your spouse or will with your spouse in the future or will with someone else. God did it. Understand that. Divorce is not God's plan at all. This morning I have three points and they're rather quick points, and there are points that, that come from my heart, as I said, that I have learned through my marriage to do and apply, and it seems to work very well, but it is very difficult to do. It takes work. It takes humility, and it takes strength to humble yourself to a point where you have, you, you have no rights. You might even feel like a doormat, you might even feel like you've been abused and used and it's not right for them to do that, but it works because it's biblical. Three points. Surrender to God. Commit to each other. And then enjoy each other. And then enjoy each other. Those three points that I have this morning. So surrender to God. What does that mean? Surrender to God. When I was a kid, my brother and I used to be in the south part of the house in a room. We, we, we bunked together in one room. My sisters, uh, two of them bunked just in the room next to us on the north side of us. And, and in this room, I was the eldest of, of the children. He was the third eldest. And so I pretty much got my way. It was my room. You just happened to live here. You know, and, and so he get to stay there, but I pretty much controlled things. And whenever uh, he would argue with me or fight with me or, or, or try to go against me, I would pretty much get on top of him, being the older and being bigger, and, and pretty much subdue him. I, I would literally get on his chest with my legs wrapped around him and his head just right there where I could touch him and his chest, and I would do this to his chest. You surrender? You surrender? You surrender, you surrender, and he's like, no, no, you know, pride, no, 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 I don't surrender. 
Okay, I'm going to keep tapping until you surrender. No, no, no. And then all of a sudden, okay, I give, I give, I give, you know. And then he would go, not really. And I'm like, okay, back to it then, you know. <laughs> go back. And we'd go back and forth, back and forth until finally I give. And he just like, ah. Oh. Finally, he just gave up. Once in a while, I do the head, you know, just boom, 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 boom. Surrender. That's what surrender means. The dictionary says to give oneself up as into the power of another. Submit or yield. Now, I, I, I totally get it. We don't like that. Hey, we, aren't we in America? Don't we have rights? You know, and I, a, am I not an individual, my own person? No, you're not. Not biblically. You are God's. You know, I, I totally get all that. When we submit to this truth that we are to be submitted to God, okay, I'm not talking about submitting to your husband right now or to your wife. I'm talking about being submitted to God, right? This is what I'm talking about. When you are totally surrendered to the Lord, when you realize, Lord, I am not my own. You own me. I am your servant. I am your child. You direct and lead and guide me. Uh, if you, you might feel, well, wait a minute, don't I have a free will to choose to go, go someplace or maybe go to this college or university or, or not? You know, don't I have the, the free will to do that? Yes, you do. But I think as a Christian, you understand that, that when you have a desire, you always pray, Lord, if this is your will, open the doors. I, I would love to go to this college and, and I would love to be, you know, a, an engineer. I really would. This has been my passion and love for years. So open the doors. And if they open, then you know, okay, Lord, I'm going to go in. The Lord's leading you. He's guiding you. But if he shuts the door, he don't want you to be an engineer. He wants you to be something else. I wanted to be an architect. I really did. I wanted to be an architect. I, I studied architecture all the way from junior high through high school and even went to college for it. Look what I'm doing now. <laughs> it's not what God wanted me to do. Though I had a passion and a love for it, so did Virginia. We were in the same class together in high school and drafting with Mr. Hidalgo. You know, she was, I was a TA in there, a teacher's aide and, and so forth. Uh, we have plans that we've drawn up, plot plans, uh, floor plans and things like that but it's not what the Lord wanted. A, a Christian will say, Lord, I am submitted to you. Whatever your plan is for my life, I am willing to stand on my head, as I said Wednesday night, if that's what you want me to do. Whatever it is, you, you are surrendered. <clears throat> There's a story in, in King, Second Kings, about Elisha. King Ben-Hadad of Syria decided that he was going to besiege Samaria, which was the capital of Israel. His strategy was to surround the city with thousands of troops. There were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate there. And they said one to another, why sit here until we die? That was their question. They were watching this whole thing. They were le leprous. They really couldn't fight in battle. Uh, they were kind of the outcasts, you know, because they were separated from society. And they're sitting there at the gates like, why are we just sitting here? Why are we just sitting here? We're just going to die. So why sit here? This is what it says in 2 Kings 7, 4. If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we will die there. But if we, say, if we sit here, we will also die. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall die. That was their attitude. Look, we're sitting here, we'll probably die. We can go into the city. There's a famine in there because they're sieging it. No food and water can get in. We'll probably die. I know what. Let's just surrender to the Syrians. I mean, they may kill us, but maybe they won't. And so what were they doing? They were leaving it in the hands of God. Lord, if we go this direction and that direction, it seems like the doors are closed. We're going to die either way. But if we go in this direction, we don't know. We may live and we may not live, but we leave that to you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, throw us in a fiery furnace. If the Lord decides to consume us, we'll be consumed. But if he doesn't, hey, we won't be consumed because we know our God. And God didn't. And these men were saved also. See, surrendering ourselves to God means giving up of ourselves. It's a battle term. It implies giving up all rights to the conqueror. Well, is not God our conqueror? Is not God who sits on the throne? Is he not the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Is he not the God of all earth? And there are no other gods besides him, nor will there ever be any gods besides him. Who better to surrender than to God, who loves us and cares for us, 
who has our best interests, who wants to prosper us and take care of us and lead us, not to destroy us. He is not a God who's mocking and ridiculing and waiting for an opportunity to trip us up. No, he wants the best for us. So why not surrender to him? When an opposing army surrendered, it means they laid down their arms and the winners would take control of them. That's basically what it means. We should surrender to God and allow him to do his work through us. God has a plan for our lives and it means that we need to surrender first to him besides anything else. Jeremiah says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, unlike the plans that we sometimes have that may lead to destruction. Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but that end is a way of death. Oh, I don't like them and love them anymore. And they end up dying somewhere. I've seen it over and over. Christians who, who I've counseled, and you don't know what you're talking about. You just hate me. You're choosing their side. And they go off, and you watch and you see, and they're not going to church, they're not serving God, they're bitter, they're angry, and they die because of their choice. God says, stick it together. The more areas of our lives we surrender to him, the more he works in our relationships. He really does. See, I have found in my relationship with my wife that if I surrender to God, that means I surrender to her too in my relationship. I may disagree with her, but I love her enough to say that's okay. It doesn't matter. I will get upset at certain things and how they're done or not done and what is taking place and not taking place and I'll let it fester up in me to the point where I don't want to, and I'm being honest with you, where you don't want to talk to them, you don't want to see them, you just kind of like, hmm, you walk by them, you know, you know what I'm talking about and then finally you're going, why is it that I'm always the one that has to give in, you know, and they're the ones, you know, and finally you give in, you surrender and then I come over to her and I love you. <laughs> you, know, you surrender that's what a relationship is based on surrendering one to another and when you surrender to God and know that God knows all truth and you might not be getting your way it might not feel like it you might be a little prideful and God is trying to break that pride in you because you may be even right but it doesn't matter if you're right that has nothing to do with it at all it's about keeping that love with one another and keeping Christ, letting God have her because you also surrender her to him. God, she is your child, and so I surrender her to you. I let her go. I'm gonna love her. I'm gonna play my role as a husband or as a wife, and I'm going to surrender to you. And if this is the person that I am married to and who you brought to me, then I'm going to surrender to my role as an individual to them. Surrendering. That's the first step, and that definitely is the hardest step of marriage is surrendering to the Lord well what about submission I know there's a lot that I'm leaving out submission to 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 me as a wife oh yeah there there's that part surrender to God first though give her to God let God have her surrender her you play the role of the husband if she's not submitting surrender to God let God take care of her well, he's supposed to, or, or she's supposed to respect me. I'm, I'm the head of the home. Yeah, she is. You just continue to run your home and you let God work with her if she's not working. You surrender to the Lord. It's very difficult to do. But when you surrender to God and finally say, okay, Lord, I give up. I can't change them, you know? And in fact, I can't even change myself, so I just give it to you, Lord. I'm surrendering. Then you commit. Then you just commit. That's the next one. Commit to each other. No matter what, I'm committed to you. Uh, divorce is not even in my vocabulary. I'm not even thinking about it. Yeah, I'm upset. Yeah, it might take me a while. I need to calm down, but I'm totally committed to you, 100%. Now, I had an article, and I wish someone would go get it for me right now. It's in my briefcase in the desk because I forgot it. <laughs> so if someone finds it, that would be wonderful. Look in my briefcase and it's on relationships. And in this article, it was this guy who is a, 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 an author for a magazine, and it's, he's an Indian author for an Indian magazine, 
and he wrote an article on relationships and why they struggle for so long. I have a quote for you that the Lord gave me. It takes two to break a relationship, one to forgive, and generally it is the one who has been hurt the most. Let me say that again. Think about this. It takes two to break a relationship, one to forgive, and generally it is the one who has been hurt the most. To save that relationship, all it takes is that one person to forgive the other person. There's been times where um, I have had biblical counseling with someone and there has been adultery in the situation. And the one that has been hurt the most would come to me and, and say, they did this to me and I am just totally broken. I don't want them anymore. I want them in my life. I'm angry. I'm mad. I'm confused. Just all these emotions that they're going through. And so I sit down and I start talking about surrendering first. It's the first thing. We don't even deal with the subjects. Have you surrendered to God? Are you surrendered to him? That is the first and foremost. Do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that no matter what storm you're going through in life, he will get you through in that life. So being totally surrendered. And then I will deal with that issue. And usually what I do is I I ask them, do you love them? Do you love them? And you know what? More than not, they're like, yes, I do. I just love them. Okay, next step. Commit and forgive them. I'll hear silence. They're just like, okay. Uh, You know how hard that is? Okay, let's define forgive. You go to them and you say, I forgive you. I will never mention it again. I will not bring it up. It is very difficult for me, but we're going to work through this. And they look at me like, That's almost impossible to do. I'm like, I totally get it. I know it is. And in fact, when if you do it and you decide to do it, you will bring it up down the road and it will cause some problems. But you have to then forgive again and try to work through that and not bringing it up again. That is what you have to do if you love the person. You have every right biblically to to get a divorce and I don't I don't tell them they don't. But if you love them and you want this to work and you are committed to one another, then this is what you're going to have to do. And I've seen it work when people do forgive because they're committed to one another, even in adultery. We have biblical stories of that happening. And as hard as that is, God is faithful to those couples. And you know what? It speaks so highly of them. Someone said, I want my life and my marriage to look less like the world and more like Christ. I want my life and my marriage to look less like the world and more like Christ. Then thirdly, you have to stick around for second service if you want to hear the, that article. <clears throat> thirdly, and I love this one. I, I really do love this one. and I, it, It's where I'm at right now. Enjoy one another. Just enjoy one another. Just enjoy each other's company, um, fellowship, communication. Have a great time together. This is your spouse. This is the one you spend all of your life with on this earth. The good and the bad, the worst and the worst. You know, the good health and worst health. And, so, and it's coming, the worst health. A friend of mine, let me save that for the end if I remember. Let, let me share with you what James says. If any among you suffering, James 5.13, if any among you are suffering, let him pray. Let him pray if you're suffering. If your marriage is suffering, pray. pray get on your knees and pray, pray, pray. Prayer is, is the most powerful thing you could ever do in your marriages. Pray. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. Get on your knees and pray. Then he goes on, if anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. But if everything is great and you're cheerful and she's cheerful, man, sing songs together. Laugh together. Do things together. Enjoy one another. 
I'm enjoying these days with my wife. Uh, we have committed to taking Thursdays off in, in spite of all that's going on. I mean, it's just crazy how much is going on right now. But Thursdays is our day, and we just spend the day together. Uh, next week, we have plans on just going to Newport Beach. And there's a, a spot there, a Starbucks. We just sit there, have some coffee. Then we're going to drive up the coast a little bit. Uh, is it Or down the coast towards Mexico. And we're going to stop off at Javier's restaurant. And we're going to meet up some high school friends that we've been witnessing to. And we're gonna just going to meet up with them and then just kind of see where the Lord takes. We don't really try to plan too much, but just, just spend the day together. Uh, and then the rest of the week, six days, we're working like crazy from morning till night. Uh, and that's fine. But I'm loving it. She's loving it. Let me give you some practical ways on how to enjoy one another because you might not even know how to do that. <laughs> you might not know how. Well, how do I enjoy my spouse? Because all he wants is you know what. <laughs> That's a man for you. Well, how do I enjoy my, my wife? Because she just wants to go clothes shopping, you know, or spend money. You know, I, I love that with my wife. I love going to watch her spend clothes shopping. I, I'm one of those guys that love to watch her do that when we go out and hit in the shops, and I'll take pictures of her. One, enjoy your spouse for who they are just for who they are w w with the good and the bad this is who god allowed them to be made them to be created them to be the bad stuff he'll take care of and the more that you love her the more that you take care of her the more that you respect him the more that you honor him the more that he'll change but just love them for who they are and encourage them in that discover and foster those mutual interests what do you have in common you know, with my wife and I, it's, it's church. We just love church. We love talking about end times prophecies. You know, we love talking about what's going on in the world today. And so, you know, whatever those interests are, and, and there might be interests that you're not really interested in, but that's okay. Be interested in it because she's interested in it. And then prioritize or prioritize your spouse. Make them first in your life. They should be first in your life before your children. God obviously first, and then your wife has to be next. Fourth, spend quality time with your spouse. You need to really do that. For years, and this is the years that we struggled with, I would always hear teachings, you need to have a date night, right? Your husband and wife, have a date night. And I kind of, ah, we don't need no date night, you know? We're getting along just fine. Of course, we were struggling through the whole thing. And now it's like we need a date day <laughs> with all that's going on. We just need us, you know. Virginia's mom said, okay, go away. We'll see you. I'm fine here. Leave me alone. Go off. Just have a time together and enjoy one another. Spend quality time with your spouse. That goes along with prioritizing. Remind your spouse of their best qualities, especially when they feel vulnerable. This is important. We live in a very negative world, and we can become very negative. I am fine, and you know me that I'm a very negative person. I get depressed really easy. I've struggled with all those things my whole life. No one loves me. Nobody loves me, just you, babe. I just want to die. I don't really matter. Last night, me and Gabby were looking up uh, uh, some, she loves makeup, and so I'm spending time with Gabby, and she just loves makeup. Look at this one popping. So this girl, you know, she, takes off all her makeup and you go oh man whoa and then she puts it all on and you go like wow <laughs> you know like how did they do that you know and she's like two million likes and so i'm like okay hey, hey look up our, our our youtube site how many likes do i got on my on my teachings so she looks it up seven <laughs> like what i'm like 14 then she goes, here's a hundred and something. I look, oh, that's the summer fest. That's not even my teaching. <laughs> I'm going, man, that says a lot about my teaching, doesn't it? And I started like, wow, what am I doing there? Maybe I shouldn't be teaching. You know, that's the type of person I am. That's the type of person I am. So finding the positive, the good in, in your spouse, you know, you're good at this. You're good at that. My wife's good at everything. 
<laughs> I just like, man, there's, you're always good. I mean, you're good, you're good in our relationship. Uh, you always give in. You know, you always humble yourself. You always cater to me. You know, and that's really what has changed um, our relationship was her, is that she really surrendered to God. She's the one that's been hurt the most, and she's surrendered to it, and it just blows me away. Find out the good qualities and build on that. Let me give you an example of it. <clears throat> we live in Harupa Valley in this area. Most of us do, not all of us. But you can live in a community, and that's it. You just live in the community. But you know you can be in, you can be in love with your community? You know how you fall in love? Do something for your community. Doing this summer fest has made me fall in love with Harupa Valley. I didn't have that love before. I had a love for the people in it and to see them come to know Jesus Christ, but for the city itself. Having the summer fest, having the mayor come out, having city councils come out, having park board members come out, various people and meeting them and so forth has given me a love for Harupa Valley. I had taken a picture early in the morning. I was off to get my Starbucks and then here at church, I think it was like 5 o'clock or 5.30. And I happened to be at the Wineville and Limonite stop sign. I took a picture of the whole road going down with no cars, sunset coming up. And I posted it on our Harupa Valley. And man, that thing went viral. There was, there was probably over 150 likes on there, you know? Just people were just liking it. One person said, can I use this for my... And I'm like, hey, this is Harupa Valley's. And I just have this love for Harupa Valley now. See, if you start putting some emphasis on things, you start following in love. Jesus said that wherever your treasure is, there your heart will follow. So if you start looking at your spouse and saying, they're good at this. Oh, I love you, honey. I love you, honey. Oh, you're good at this. You're wonderful. All of a sudden, you'll start loving them because you're investing in them. And you're seeing those good qualities of them. So be positive. Get rid of the negative. Yeah, they're there. Yeah, they're a part of us, but don't worry about it. Let God have those things. Negative will just keep you down, keep you bummed, and keep your relationship stagnant. Just focus on the positive. But wait a minute, how do we correct one another? Well, that will come. That will come in your relationship as you love one another because you're more open to change. Remind your spouse of their best qualities. Find activities you can do together. Find activities you can do together whatever it, that activity uh, is. Do things with your spouse. Uh, you do not need a reason, and you should not expect anything in return. Celebrate. I got blessed yesterday. Uh, someone blessed me big time, and, and I just went up to my wife, and I said, man, I'm just, I just really got blessed. So then I blessed her. She's like, oh, wow, thank you. And I just did it for no reason at all. And she was just like, Wow, thank you so much. She just, I, I could see her just being lifted up because she was then blessed. Eighth, celebrate in your spouse's success. If your spouse has accomplished something, even small things, create a cheer, celebrate for her, um, lift her up, laugh with your spouse. Just, I love it when Virginia laughs and I try to make her laugh because there's a lot of things that just make us frown. You know, life can just make you frown. And I'll go to take a picture. I'm like, smile. She's like, no, really smile. Show those teeth, you know. Come on. And then she starts laughing. Just make them laugh. The uh, Bible talks about laughter being good for the body, right? It's like medicine. It's good to just laugh. Me and Gabby were busting up last night. They could hear us out in the living room. We were la she was laughing so hard. Isn't one of those, you know one of those laughs? where you can't stop laughing, you're like, okay, stop. Like, <laughs> you just kept going. I mean, that's the type of laugh that we should have with our spouse. And enjoy spending time with your spouse. Just enjoy one another. Let me give you some application to close here. And this one you have to think about. You might want to write it down, but you have to think about this. Love and you can do no harm. Love and you can do no harm. Just love. God's love for one another and you can't do any harm in that relationship.